Hello everyone and welcome to UCL Connect How to Be Daringly Creative with guest speaker Jason Bevan. I'm Sarah Kaliris and I work in UCL's alumni relations team as an alumni volunteer manager focusing on our digital volunteering programs and I'm very excited to be part of this event and can't wait to hear what Jason has in store for us. To start I'm going to give you a bit of background on the UCL Connect event series and what you can expect from today's event. Um, next slide please. UCL graduates are part of a diverse and talented global community, rich with skill and expertise to tap into. UCL Connect is here to help you develop the knowledge and skills you need to thrive in your career long after graduation. Our UCL Connect programme is dedicated to bringing professional development skill and expertise directly to alumni and students across the global UCL community. Whether you're establishing your career, moving into a new industry or considering your options post-graduation, the UCL Connect event series has something for everyone. UCL Connect ranges from in-person panels to online workshops and resources such as blogs, case studies and podcasts. Uh, next slide, please. You can see some of our previous UCL Connect sessions listed on the screen. If any of those pique your interest, you can find recordings on our um, alumni networking platform, UCL Bentham Connect, where we share professional development resources created by the alumni community and accessible to all alumni graduates and students. You can see a URL for the platform at the bottom of your screens and all UCL students, alumni and current staff can sign up for an account. Next slide, please. So I'm going to quickly go over the running order of today's event. Shortly, I'll introduce our fabulous alumni speaker, Jason Bevan, who will then share his presentation on how to be daringly creative. Following this, there will be a Q&A session where you can ask Jason your questions. To do this, please just write your questions in the Q&A function, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. You can also use the upvoting function to vote for any questions you'd particularly like to hear Jason answer. We'll then prioritise these when reading them out to Jason. Do feel free to share your questions throughout the event. The event, there's no need to wait for the Q&A session to uh, start before you share your questions. The event will then close at night at 7.30 um, GMT. Just a warning that the webinar will end quite abruptly when we've reached the end of the event. But I want to remind everyone that the event is being recorded and we'll be able to share this with you in the next few weeks. So without further ado, I'm absolutely delighted that we're joined by Jason Bevan for today's UCL Connect event. Having met with Jason a couple of weeks ago and hearing a sneak preview into some of his incredible experiences and insights, I'm very excited to hear his presentation today on how to be daringly creative. Jason has had an inspiring career and has worked with equally inspiring people. After graduating from UCL in 1994 with a degree in geography, Jason went on to become head of creative development at Warner Brothers Studios, EMEA working with legendary filmmakers and marketing movies, including the Harry Potter and Fast Fantastic Beasts films and the Dark Knight trilogy. During this event, Jason will delve into how to push the boundaries of creativity and tap into those big ideas to support your development. He'll demystify how we generate ideas and show us how to harness the creative skills we all have but don't often use. So Jason, thanks so much for joining us uh, and over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Sarah, and uh, pleasure to be with you guys this evening. And I am just going to quickly now share my screen and we'll get on with the presentation. So, um, there we go. So, um, as Sarah said, I used to look after the marketing and creative development process of Warner Brothers and Amir. I left at the end of the last year and I was lucky enough to be able to work on a lot of the Harry Potter films, um, the Dark Knight, Joker, the It Horror movies, the Hangover movies, um, and of course a lot of the Christopher Nolan movies as well, who's a much more famous UCL alum than I am, um, like films like Dunkirk and Inception. Um, I spent a lot of my career developing a lots of bold, out-of-the-box creative solutions and working with some very creative filmmakers. Um, and marketing people to develop a lot of campaigns um, and ideas that really did have quite a bit of significant cultural impact right across the world. 
Most importantly, though, I think kind of what I really saw from that was a lot of big, important, wider lessons that we can learn from them and the way that these people think. Um, and I'm going to talk you through some tips as to how to bring creativity more into your culture, wherever that may be, um, both on a personal level, also on an organizational level as well, um, using some examples from films that I've been working on. Um, so here's a little ed edit of some of, the, some of the movies that that's included over the last few years. They're watching us. Focus me. Huh? All eyes on us. All eyes on us. All eyes on us. Bring the action. Brace for impact. So just before we get started, I'm going to use, uh, using the survey tool now, I'm going to ask everyone um, a quick question. Do you feel that creativity is one of your best strengths as an individual? So if you can just a quick yes or no answer, uh, we're going to do this as quickly as we possibly can and have a quick look at what that produces. Give everyone just a couple of seconds then just to be able to hit yes or no. Do you feel that creativity is one of your best strengths as an individual? So let's see where that nets us out. So 70%, which is great. That is a really good, strong result. But almost a third there are people still saying that they, um, they don't think that their creativity is a good strength of theirs. Um, and I have to say, that is incredibly high. And I'm really, really encouraged to see that, actually. Um, but there are lots and lots of things that you, we're going to be able to do to talk about how we get that number up. So because I'm really a passionate believer that creativity is inside all of us. Um, we do take lots of creative decisions every single day. We take lots of we 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 use our brain creatively in lots of little ways, um, but we often don't give ourselves credit for it. Um, so, um, but hopefully, with the ten tips that we're going to talk about towards the end of the presentation, you're going to have even more fuel. And even if you do think you're creative, I hope that you will feel even even more creative by the time we finish having a chat now. We're now coming out of a pandemic, and um, there's definitely nothing like the. Uh, a real global crisis to be able to spur innovation. Um, because just after like the end of the second, first and second world wars gave real rise to a renaissance of ideas and perspectives and culture. So the global crisis that we're coming out of is definitely an opportunity to do the same. Milton Friedman, who was a Nobel winning economist said that only a crisis actual or perceived um, produces real change. And when that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are available at the time. So coming out of this crisis, let's make sure that we really do something that do really make the very most to try and um, make the most positive outcome that we can um, on our way out of this and into a more normal life. We're now at a critical juncture where we can do one of two things. We can ignite and innovate our way out of this crisis, um, just like Tesla have been doing with their space program. 
or you can fizzle out like some of these brands that unfortunately went into liquidation during the, um, uh, during the pandemic. Because ignoring the need to innovate is really not an option. Um, and exposing the failure of people that have been unwilling to recreate themselves has been a sadly poignant reality of the virus. With all the adversity and challenges that are facing us at the moment, it really is that stark. If you don't fully and culturally commit to keep creating the chances of your organization, or perhaps even more scary still, the chances of your own career being alive and thriving in 10 years time are slashed. Um, the Confederation of British Industry has told us that 90% of us are gonna to need to find fundamentally new skills within the next nine years to be able to keep thriving. A big reason for that is obviously artificial intelligence. It's gonna keep chasing us humans and competing with our skills as it gets stronger and stronger with its analysis and process efficiency and uh, speed and ease, decreased cost and massive scale. Um, so the ability that we need to focus on the things that artificial intelligence does not have. And I would argue that innovation and creativity as well as relationships are some of the biggest advantages that we have over AI going forward. If you wanna make sure that your career and your job is boosted and not consumed by AI, then it's a really good idea to be able to focus on those skills where you can add value. Because going back to human innovation at its very earliest stages, anthropologists have consistently seen that the tribes who survive are the ones that embrace change and innovation. The others that haven't have just simply ceased to exist. Because we're now in an age in a, where the courage of people like this young lady to, um, presenting to the UN on climate change at the age of 16, and obviously most um, even more recently um, with everything that's going on currently at the moment with the summit um, up in Glasgow, that her bravery really does expose the sheer tragic timidity of people that just resign themselves to conform and just be the same as everybody else. Well, I'm sorry if that all sounds a little bit chilling because here's where things get a lot more positive, I promise. Um, I was lucky enough to work on some of the best loved movies um, and with all these amazing filmmakers and cast that made, made them. And that really did show me just how creative the human mind can be and how much inspiration we can take from iconic films um, and the people that made them. Because the, the mo one of the most important things that they showed me is that there's a real mountain of scientific proof that when we're, we're much better at doing something when we're enjoying it. Um, we can bring back a lot of passion and fun into our work through creativity. We know that being happy releases dopamine, which is the reward drug, into our heads, which helps the idea process and it also helps us focus. On the other side, this is The Nun, um, one of the horror movies that we worked on as part of The Conjuring Horrorverse. We simply cannot be creative when we're under, th when we're under threat or scared of being shot down. And what that means is that 86% of ideas in the workplace stay silent many of them due to self-doubt or fear of what other people might think of them. I would really encourage you not to be one of them. Here's a really good film example of brave creativity where people actually really dared to do something very different. Think about the age of the much loved and idolized superheroes. I'm talking about the people with big muscles and serious expressions with unflinching coolness. And then think about the real guts and risk that it took like a big, a big studio like Fox to green light Deadpool he was thrusting groin in his naked superhero bum for the first time. That was a very, very bold move. And why did they do that? It wasn't just to make the film more funny. They did it because the holy grail for a big film is to break free from the traditional genre and the traditional audience that would go and see your type of film, be it sci-fi, action, romantic, comedy, whatever it might be, and dramatically expand your audience and, of course, the revenue that the film makes by appealing to a much, much wider audience um, and taking superhero movies into that new genre of being funny, witty, and really cutting, really totally transformed that sector and that genre. In fact, Disney with Marvel recreated much of their studio fortunes on the success of Marvel um, and the pun punchy, funny one-liners from people like Robert Downey Jr. and Iron Man. The basic uh, rationale on how to think creative, creatively is really, really simple. And the reason you're seeing train tracks here is because I call it train tracks of thought. When we're born, children have a natural open door inquisitiveness, um, but they also think very wide and, wide and open. Um, and by the time they go into schools and rules and all these kinds of things that the adult world starts to bombard them with, they start, like us adults, to think more closed-mindedly. 
Um, and they start to think within strict boundaries. And that's particularly the case for, uh, for people in large organizations. And instead of expanding idea, our ideas like we did when we were much younger, we start to reduce our ideas down and look for weaknesses so that we don't look silly in front of other people when we, um, when we come out with them. And that's why I call it train tracks of thought. Um, we tend to visit the same stops along the line. We like, tend to sort of tweak our thoughts rather than fundamentally reimagining them and going the, into the much scarier world of really open door thinking to really evaluate how what we're doing and how. I mean, really daring to take the handbrake off, just like we've been talking about with the superhero movies and Deadpool. Walt Disney himself was brilliant at doing that. Um, he developed this thing called the multiplane camera that you can see in front of you, and it was first used on Bambi. Um, and there were different scenes in the film that were stacked on those different frames that you can see, and it was shot from above, and that gave the film much more depth, the image and made it look much deeper and richer. But actually, he went much further than that. And in cinemas, he wanted people, a uh, scent spread onto people. Um, he wanted 3D but, and all these other technologies and things. That was 80 years before we got into anything like um, 4DX. He was so far ahead of his time. But then he actually went even one step further than that. He said, well, look, if you're being part of my film, it would be great if you could actually be, go and visit this land that the film is all about, maybe interact with the, camera, with the characters on real sets where they live. And suddenly Disneyland was born. And that was a legitimate game changer that introduced the multi-billion dollar concept of the theme park into the world. I would say that that was pretty great open door innovation. In fact, years later, when I was working for Disney, um, we helped turn it back the other way and took one of their most popular rides, the Pirates of the Caribbean, and made that into a multi-billion dollar film franchise with Jack Sparrow, the pirate. You may more recently have seen Jungle Cruise with Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt, which is the same thing. Um, here's another really interesting rule that filmmaking chose to ignore to its benefit. Um, cars in movies traditionally had to have two axles, and amongst other things, they were finished in spray paint and lacquer. Um, think about the Bond movie recently. Um, you can think about you know, the, the, DeLor the DeLorean from the Back to the Future. They looked cool, they had lots of fun gadgets, but they were very much like normal cars with all of those extra toys on top. Now the brilliant UCL alum, Chris Nolan and his production designer, Nathan Crowley, really decided to completely think differently when they went for the Dark Knight trilogy. Um, and they created a totally new type of Batmobile, actually in Chris's garage in LA using plastic toy model kit. Um, and create this amazing Batmobile with lots of amazing unthought of accessories, but actually on a much simpler level, it also had no front axle at all and was finished in matte black paint. They really fundamentally rethought the look and design of the classic Batmobile and really made one of the most iconic movie vehicles of all time. I remember seeing this vehicle for the first time in a large Zeppelin hangar in Cardington in Bedfordshire and realized this was gonna be a massive hit and asked if we could tour it around the world for publicity events. Um, the film did really well. Um, by the second uh, film with The Dark Knight in the trilogy, um, it actually became the big, uh, it took the biggest box office of all time in the US. That was about a lot more than just the Batmobile, but it was one area where they really showed how different and bold they could be. But interestingly, soon uh, a lot of the world's privately owned supercars soon started sporting matte black paint and even, and even flaming tailpipes, just like the Batmobile. And that was real proof that we'd actually pervaded global culture with this new idea. I'd ask everyone now also, just you often get some of those days where you get to the end of the day and feel like you've gone through a lot of stuff, but you haven't really challenged your brain. And there's a, there's a real, there's a scientific reason for that. We use only about 13% of our brain for much of our working day to just to be efficient, move fast and get stuff done. 82% of our brain is subconscious. And that's where most of our ideas come from. And the reason I call it open door thinking is that the real route to be able to get into that exponentially creative zone for us is opening that door to the bigger um, creative part of our brain. I, I developed this presentation with a clinical psychologist, so hopefully a lot, of, a lot of this stuff is very accurate scientifically. Because that efficiency of getting through all the day-to-day -day stuff and staying in that operational 13% of our brain keeps us within the lines on those train tracks and stops us from accessing that creativity. In fact, quite often, we get so used to the lines and the train tracks that we even forget that they're there um, and totally lose sight of that, that we're, that, that we're actually just staying within this more conventional area of idea making. We stay in those familiar areas of thinking where we feel comfortable, safe and happy. If we're in a big organization, it's even more so the case. 
we can very rarely be creative when we're just trying to get through the day and get all of that action list ticked off. And I'd also just ask you to think about, are you really happy accepting that you're only using such a small part of your brain for such a large part of your working life? Here's another really good example of daring to be really new. This was uh, 1937. It was Walt's first feature animated movie, um, the first big cartoon animation that came out in cinemas, the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And actually it proved that even he didn't know, know everything because by the time many years later, they got round to Toy Story and John Lasseter and Pixar came, came into the fray with Disney. They really break the, break the mold with adult humor in animation. You remember that scene where Buzz Lightyear's wings pop up uncontrollably when he first sees Jesse the cowgirl for the first time. That was incredibly bold because Disney right up until then had been so associated with Puritan family animation. Um, and that would have been a massive shift for them. But by bringing adult, adult humor into the film, it gave a totally new audience because up until then, really it was, they were just families that came to see animated movies. Think about how different that is now to the type of audiences that come and see animated films because they know that the adults and the older people have got one type of film that's got lots of jokes for them. And of course the children have got another different film um, that's got plenty in it for them too. And that totally changed the revenues and fortunes of animated films forever. Um, regularly now, Disney, when they're releasing big animated films, they're making over a billion dollars at the box office. And PS, yes, it also made Pixar into a multi-billion dollar co company within a few years. Think of on a very different level, Joker, a film that I was lucky enough to work on in the, um, in the last couple of years. And that, again, was another really legitimate example of groundbreaking um, creativity. Um, right at the time, it was when mental health was really becoming a big issue in the news with the royals getting on board. And it was a massive communications risk um, to, be, to, take, to, to take this point of view on mental health, mental health, which was all about violence, being associated with mental health, all of the things that um, a lot of the, the good work that was being done on mental health at the time was trying to avoid. Um, but also there's another point that was to, to be taken from, the, um, from what the Jokers are doing here. When you first get into really exponential, bold open door creativity, it can often feel a bit forced at the time. And it really quite scary before you start to see actually where this bold new direction can take you. And I mean, when, when you start, you really can't see over the hill to what your ideas can become um, as you really leave behind a lot of the traditional way you've been thinking in the past. And that can really be very scary. In fact, so many films had the same sort of process. I remember seeing some of the, um, the Hobbit trilogy coming through for the first time. And those films fundamentally changed from the first cuts that we saw. Um, and that happened on a lot of different movies. You really have to stick with the creative process um, and continue right the way through those uncomfortable stages at the beginning um, when you really might not necessarily like a lot of the ideas that you're coming up with. The creativity process can give birth to a lot of ugly babies. So, just to kind of round things off, I'm now gonna give you 10 really, hopefully I think clear tips um, as to how you can get much more creative in your day-to-day -day working environments. Um, take some really clear um, uh, hard learnings that I've developed out of um, what I've seen from working with some of these movies and the big makers. The first is believing you can do it. This is a picture from uh, Socrates. He believed he had a spiritual demon that would come to him. The Renaissance would put humans at the center of everything. And the inspiration would come to them. Well, Socrates may have been brilliant at his time, but I think now it's kind of accepted that if something's going to happen, you need to play your part and make it happen. The inspiration demon will come to you, but you've got to let it in by proactively opening the door and believing in yourself with real courage. Innovation's not going to hit us passively. You have to go after it with grit, ambition and determination. But above all, bravery. You've got some of you may remember these guys from The Hangover. The person you may not recognize quite so well is the guy in the baseball cap. He's Todd Phillips. He directed The Joker. But also when The Hangover came up, it came out of absolutely nowhere. Todd wanted another $10 million to add to the film's budget. And they told him if they did that, he had to have a more famous person in the, in the cast. Um, he pushed back and said, no, I really believe in this cast, who at the time, apart from Bradley Cooper, were relatively unknown. But he said, if you give me that extra $10 million, I will cut dramatically my fee as a director um, by about 90%. But when you get the box office that you need to justify that extra investment, I want 15% of the net. Todd, by, by that level of creative bravery, and he genuinely did go ahead with that and took an almost expenses only fee as a director, 
Todd took a fee of $70 million for The Hangover. Um, that film absolutely came out of nowhere. That is an example, again, of true creative bravery and believing in yourself. The second rule is about being yourself and committing emotionally, except that you're all, we're all gonna come up with lots of different stuff in a brainstorm and that's a good thing. Bring your head and your heart together and accept that you are going to come up with very different things. Be you, focus on your strengths and let other people focus on theirs because it will all help the creative process when it all comes together. And also accept that we all develop ideas in lots of different ways, being in groups or on our own. Find your way of developing ideas and let other people go their way, quiet or noisy, adrenaline or calm. Because coming up with ideas can be very unpredictable. We all need our own personal ways of developing ideas. We all have our own idiosyncrasies. I, Einstein said that it was important to foster individuality because only the individual can produce new ideas. But before we come on to that, another, another quick tip. I want to ask you about barriers to creativity. So we're going to do another quick survey here. What do you think the key things are that might stop creativity within your organisation? So the availability of funding, swift decision making to action ideas, a concern that your idea might not be well received by management or colleagues, a lack of time to think and reflect, or a risk averse culture. If we can just do those as quickly as possible, that would be great. We're really interested to see what the results are for this. So funding, swift decision making, concern that your idea might not be well received, lack of time or a risk averse culture. Let's see where that nets us out. Well, here we go. Actually quite an interesting even mix here, but not surprisingly, up in front, only just up in front, concern that your idea may not be well received by management or colleagues. And that is absolutely very, very normal. But actually, to be quite honest, lots on the other, on the other levels as well. Availability of funding, swift decision making, lack of time to think and reflect, a risk averse culture. So thanks very much for those. But I think, yeah, absolutely, that, that idea of what on earth is everyone going to think of my idea? And therefore, that brings us very neatly onto the, next, um, onto the next topic, which is all about bosses. Because to be inspired, we need to feel confident that we've got the support of our colleagues and our bosses to be bold and cut through. We need to take risks to be able to go through that uncomfortable bit where you really need to start to get bold about coming up with ideas. And for bosses, that means ensuring that your team still stay true to core principles and beliefs that, the, that, the, that your organisation believes in but that you are bold enough to take risks. Um, in many industries, in, like in film, 90% of the profits came from about five or 10% of what we were putting into the market. And that happens in lots of different places as well. And that means by definition that 90% of what we were putting into the market wasn't necessarily doing that well. We've got to accept that failure is gonna be a natural part of the creative process and that we can't always get it right first time. And absolutely, as everyone was saying, as, as, as you were saying in your poll, um, that has to be backed up by spirit of empowered decision taking, a swift, nimble decisions. Um, and the reason I'm showing you a picture of a baby tiger here is because he knows he's got absolutely no chance of catching those agile, darting little goldfish there. He would have a much better chance of a large, slow moving trout happen to come swift, swift uh, uh, moving along, of getting his claws into it. But he hasn't got a chance. Whilst those fish are able to start moving quickly and nimbly, um, he won't be able to catch them. And so an organization needs to act the same with, with swift decision taking to be able to put ideas into practice quickly and effectively. The next one, again, coming back to what, what, what came up in the poll, make time to think. It's so basic, but 50% of us spend less than 30 minutes or about 6% of the working week thinking, which is pretty shocking. Make time to think, be it in your lunch break or another time, set aside time in your diary for focus with less noise. Um, and that means either as an individual or as a team or as a company. Um, and that also means looking up from your cell phone and powering down. Um, technology in the digital world is brilliant for sharing ideas, but it's also terrible for causing distraction. We need to be able to focus. Um, and when you're ideating in a room, try and avoid tables and divisions in the room. Have lots of natural light. And if you can, have sort of naturally he healthy sugars and brain food in the room as well. Um, tables tend to split up the room and, um, and can stop the idea generation and flow around the room. Here's Theresa May coming out onto that stage for that unfortunately infamous moment in her career where she came on to Dancing Queen, which is not a great move for Theresa's career as it turned out at the time. But the reason I'm showing you this slide is get comfortable being uncomfortable. 
when you come up with an idea and it gives you a slightly nervous feeling inside your tummy, that's often a really good sign because that's a clear signal that you're leaving those train tracks of thought and you're coming up with something that's refreshingly different that makes you feel, that gets the adrenaline going inside your body. Tip number six is a competition. Um, it's good, but in ideation, it's got to be friendly competition. It's got to be legitimate encouragement, too much competition, and it can focus on shooting down ideas. Um, and quite a lot of what happens in, in brainstorms is that people tend to focus on trying to get their own idea across rather than listening and encouraging other people's. And a big part of the reason um, why this is so important is that if, you, if it's just you that's coming up with the idea and it doesn't get shared around the room, your chances of being able to make it work plunge. The moment that you say yes and, and people in the room start building on the idea, well, funny enough, they then start to share ownership of the idea as well. And of course, it's chances of getting approved and signed off go through the roof because the more people that, that feel enfranchised by the idea and feel that they were part of creating it, the more likely it is to go ahead. The idea wins the day, not the head that it came from. In fact, at some point, I found this many times in my career, I ended up having to convince lots of other people that it was their idea to be able to get it approved. Um, and ground your thinking in really solid customer insight before you start thinking. A really good creative brief is again, a very fundamental basic part of ideating, but it is so important. Really make sure that your brief is grounded in very solid customer insight and understanding. Would you commit that to go to that for that idea and, um, and buy it if you were in your customer's shoes? Really understand their thought process and make sure that it is deeply embedded in the creative, um, in the creative process that you embark on, making sure that it's very, very clear which sandbox you need to play in. Idea number, um, the tip number eight is all about positive inertia. This is Jim Carrey in a film called Yes Man, where his character had to say yes, uh, yes to everything. Say yes and in a session. It's much more than stopping no's, and it's much more also than just saying an idea is, is great when you actually don't believe that that's the case. Don't lie in a brainstorm, but do allow an idea to build. Throw it around the room. Again, it allows people to, to, to feel that they're part of the process, but it also enables you to be able to build really using all of the brains in the room. Um, and start with an idea may not work at the beginning. By the time you finish adapting it and throwing it around the room and giving other people a chance to contribute, it may take on a totally different form. Yes, absolutely. Rationalize the idea very clearly and decide whether or not you want to use it. But do that after the brainstorm's ended. Do that another day to keep that positivity going in the room. A great example of that with the Harry Potter films. They were honestly the only film sets that I ever went on that could genuinely call themselves a family. The reason they did that was because of so many children were taking part in the movies and they wanted those, those film sets to feel open, warm, embracive places for those people. So no matter what age you were, you could give a good on, um, good on screen camera performance. But that also had the huge benefit of, the, of, of making so much more creativity. Look at that absolute creative goal that they were able to produce um, during, the, um, during the lifetime of that franchise. And now as it continues as Fantastic Beasts and the Wizarding World, they were genuinely one of some of the warmest, most welcoming places that I ever went on um, during my film career. And it really did transform, I think, the, creative, the quality of the creativity that they were able to get out of those films. Um, for my own part, actually going onto those sets, um, maybe it gave, gave me the idea to be able to put a lot of the film sets into a train and travel it around Europe. Um, and I realized on the day, rather nerve wracking first day that we launched it in Paris. Um, and I asked the security guard how long the queue was to get on board. And he told me that it was one and a half kilometers long. We kind of realized that we had a good, um, a good success on our hands. Um, and rule number nine is all about mixing with lots of different people from different skills and departments to create what we call creative collisions. Quite often, we're too close to our own work to be able to see through. And things that should be extremely obvious to us are quite, quite often get, end up being pointed out to us by people that have got nothing to do with our line of work. We call them uninformed geniuses or naive experts. It's those moments when someone that is nothing to do with what you do asks you a question. It could even be a parent, it could be a friend, it could be someone that you're talking about your job to socially. And they ask you something that you suddenly realize, well, actually that is so basic. Maybe we haven't thought about that. Or if we have thought about it, we haven't come, and come back to it for a good four or five years. Why don't we go back and have another look at it again? Organize coffees and meetings with people in other departments and jobs. Working remotely from home is a perfect way to do that. 
Harrison Ford was a good example of that. He was an on-set carpenter. He just kept suggesting great ideas to the director. Um, and that also goes from bringing variety into the room for the types of people that are present ideating. Don't just keep the same people coming back into your brainstorms because guess what? That will, that will make, it was a surefire way to make sure that you come up with similar ideas time and time again. Make sure that there are lots of different people in the room. When I was at Warner Brothers, we used to try and make sure that at least 30% of the people in the room ideating were interns. And that was because the core audience that goes to see movies in cinemas is between 15 and 30. And we wanted to make sure that that age group was well represented in the room. Should the most experienced person or senior person in the room be running the brainstorm? Throw it around, give, it, give yourselves a chance. But make sure that there's a really good mix of people from all sorts of backgrounds, cultures, um, and of course, diversity, um, to be able to bring, um, to be able to bring a so lots of points of view into the brainstorm. So quick last um, uh, survey here. Um, where are you when you come up with your best ideas? So outside getting fresh air or walking about, uh, after sports or more strenuous physical exercise, in the bath or the shower, I had to put that in because a lot of people do come up with it, cooking or other household tasks, in bed, asleep, or working in the office. So again, just a few seconds, just to put, um, give people time just to come back, come back to that. Where are you when you usually come up with your best ideas? Outside, after exercise, in the bath or the shower, just generally doing things about the house, asleep, or working in the office? What does everyone think of that? Again, another very good outside mix, but outside getting fresh air and walking and walking about is absolutely um, consistently a really good, um, yeah, a very high performer. In the bath or the shower, coming up in bed, asleep. Um, so um, on that very topic, yeah, I would fully absolutely agree with that. Changing your physical environment is incredibly important um, because it does definitely give you physical exercise, going on walks, coming away from your usual surrounding. The one notable example that wasn't on a lot of those um, that people do very, very rarely say, when they, where are they when they come up with great ideas? In the office. Hardly anyone ever says in the office. So get out of the office, get out of that environment. Um, I quite often do get endorphins after you know coming back from a run, coming up with ideas. If you're brainstorming about a specialist area or something, immerse yourself into that product. You know, we often used to find that the film sets were incredibly inspiring for taking us to new places. It reboots your thinking. It gets you out of that, again, off those train tracks of thought and into a different space. Um, I get a really, really simple way of helping the idea process. Einstein was actually in a rowing boat after an illness when he saw how relativity worked. Um, da Vinci used to sit by a stream um, and Tesla, and I'm not talking about Elon Musk, saw the electric motor in his head while he was out walking in a park. Um, and Jo Rowling was in this little coffee shop in Edinburgh when she created the story of a neglected little boy, um, an underdog recorded, re recruited from his cupboard under the stairs to Hogwarts Castle um, and his role as a celebrity wizard. And that was one of the most powerful entertainment franchises of all time created in this little nondescript um, neighbourhood cafe in Edinburgh. But lastly, and I think most importantly, just like we talked about with the Harry Potter films, whatever you're doing, have fun. Because ideating doesn't, you don't have to be serious to solve serious issues. It's a really fun experience coming up with ideas. So let's do more of it. Because without good ideas, I think a truly chilling, terrible and icy cold thing happens to you or your organisation. Absolutely nothing. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jason, and hello again. Um, that was really, really interesting, and we've had some really great questions come in while you've been speaking. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll read out a few of the, the top ones that have been voted for, um, and please do keep submitting your questions or voting for the ones that are already there as you listen to Jason's responses. So we've had quite a few in about your career path, so particularly how you moved from geography into um, a more creative field um, and specifically creative marketing and what influenced you to end up where you are now? Um, I think probably just like 
like a lot of people, it's a it's a mixture of luck. Um, it was a mixture of direction as well, you know, from con a conscious personal choice from my side. I knew that if I went into marketing and uh, um, into what I did, that it was I was never going to. It was definitely not not going to be necessarily one of the most lucrative careers that I could ever pursue. Um, there were lots of people, um, you know, who also graduated with me who went into finance and you know consulting and all of these other things that are much better paid. But for me, it was all about doing something that I was genuinely, truly passionate about and really loved. And you know, and I touched on that in the presentation. I genuinely do believe that you know when you are enjoying your job, when you're doing what you really have a passion for, it's such a basic point. And I know I'm not the only person that's ever made this, but I do believe it's so important. Um, if you love what you do, you're quite often going to be able to put that much more passion and energy and devotion into it and be so much better at it. So that was definitely the biggest sort of key point of direction for me was to going into something that I really loved. Um, and like many people, I did love movies. I started off doing a graduate training scheme at a firm called Hill and Knowlton, just down literally just um, just around the corner from UCL on Theobald's Road. Um, and bizarrely, I ended up on Theobald's Road for Warner Brothers as well, which is where their European headquarters is still now. Um, so literally just a few steps away from Bloomsbury. Um, and um, but I made the step um, from so I did three years at Hill and Knowlton, um, doing all sorts of broad PR jobs there. Um, then went over to Disney to do the PR for the theme parks and then went out to Paris um, to do, promote the um, for the launch of the second theme park out in Disneyland Paris, the Walt Disney Studios, which is where I made the bridge more into film um, and doing film premieres and junkets um, and ended up getting into film. And I can honestly say, I mean, I've been exceptionally lucky um, and have had the most you know, fantastic opportunities in my career um, and have loved every, sex, uh, every, every moment of it, to be honest. Thank you. So lucky to be able to do something you really, truly do love. Um, great advice. Um, and the next top question we've got is, you mentioned that the majority of ideas aren't shared in the workplace due to fear. How can you make we make ourselves brave enough to risk speaking up? Well, I think there's a little bit of fear if you don't as well, because <laughs> um, you know, like I said, you know, the, I mean, the CBI is saying that 90% of us are going to need to find fundamentally new skills in the next nine years. You know, I mean, you, we've, we've seen over the last two years what happens to companies if they don't keep innovating and keep creating. And that is, you know, so there is, I do believe that this should be an incentive, a carrot based, enjoyable process rather than us being forced into feeling like we've got to be creative or else, you know, everything's going to, um, you know, come, come to naught. You know, because ultimately it is a um, coming up with ideas, you know, it, it is really is an enjoyable process and it can and should be good fun. Um, but um, I think you know, getting over that fear is, you know, a it is absolutely essential um, that we that we get creative. Um, but secondly, I think you when you're coming up with an idea, just rationalize it, go through it in your head first before you come out with it. Um, Think about, you know, obviously think about the pros and cons of the idea before you, you know, before you come out with it. I mean, in a brainstorm, you should also be able to be spontaneous. I think it's quite important in a brainstorm environment to have some kind of a Chatham House rules basis there. Um, and, um, you know, where it's, it's generally accepted that what you say in that environment um, is not, you know, you're allowed to be able to have some kind of latitude um, without, you know, necessarily fear of people coming back to you and saying that something that you can't with is a, was a really, really bad idea. Um, and I think in particular with bosses as well, establishing those ground rules up front is really important. One of the tricks that I use actually quite often when I think that bosses are being intimidating of people is um, I ask people halfway through the brainstorm, we change the name of the company. And if it's a Pepsi, I will suddenly say, right, you're no longer Pepsi anymore, you're Red Bull. And what does that do to your ideas? And of course, what that does is it enables people then, um, because you've taken the company and all of the, you know, the, the ethos and the brand away from people, um, then you can't be, you know, people can't be accused of being stupid anymore because you're not necessarily representing the company um, that you work for. And that's that's quite a good, fun, interesting trick. So you know, you can you can totally transform both the company that you work for. Um, but also the environment in which you're ideating. I do think those ground rules are really, really important because if people are scared, the process is just isn't going to work and they've got to be able to trust the people that they're with um, that they won't be ridiculed by coming up with stuff that's, you know, that's really groundbreakingly new. I mean, think about, you know, Waltz and think about, you know, the superhero ideas. Um, 
you know, I would think a lot of people probably thought he was absolutely completely bonkers trying to spray scent onto people in, in the middle of movie theatres. You know, what on earth was all that about? I mean, I can also imagine when John Lasseter from Pixar was trying to pitch the first idea with Buzz Lightyear, you know, and I mean, that that wings coming out behind him when he saw Jesse the cowgirl, it's like, you know, you can you can almost hear it now, you know, with the, with the you know, him pitching to the big studio bosses in Burbank and Michael Eisner at the time, you know, hang on, John, have we got this straight, you know, you basically want to give Buzz a boner and, you know, and all this kind of just, well, yeah, you know, we're, we're a family company for God's sakes. You can't do that. And so it was a really, really bold move from them, but look what it did to them. And they had the guts to stick behind it. So um, you have got to get bold. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's just not an option for us just to keep tweaking and readjusting the things that we've done in the past, um, because otherwise there will never be any really serious change. Um, but take faith in your idea, think about it, make sure you're comfortable with it. Um, and if you, you know, if you don't feel comfortable coming out in a, in a, in a larger group, then test it out with a smaller group first. Um, but please, please, please don't just let it stay silent because that's, you know, that's such a shame. So many ideas go to waste that way. Thank you. Um, really interesting, you know, about the whole culture piece, starting right from the the basics of building up a, a culture that that is open to creativity. It's really, really interesting. Um, the next one that has quite a few votes for it is um, advice for a non-native English speaker who has a, who loves storytelling um, and the the your kind of tips for exploring opportunities in the UK's creative industries. Uh, well, look, I mean, I remember going over to France um, in 2001 and um, my French was terrible. And um, I remember being the boss of the team and um, people basically folding their arms on my first day going, well, let's, you know, Mr. British guy, what, what can you do? And having the articulation of probably a five or six year old. Um, and it was a pretty terrifying experience. Um, I actually think, to be honest, that when you are the first and most important thing is that, as I said, said during the presentation, I think that having lots of different people from all of those sorts of different sorts of backgrounds, you know, I mean, diversity and inclusion is obviously an incredibly hot topic at the moment. Um, and in creativity, it's even more important for all those reasons of trying to make sure that we come up with new ideas. So I think the very fact that you do come from a different culture, a different background, a different language is a very, very good thing um, because it will help um, shake up the ideas process rather than just having all the same people from the same city, the same basic background and all the rest of it. So that's the first thing to do. Take stock of the advantages that you're able to bring to the presentation. The second thing is, and this is particularly also relevant from when we're presenting virtually, I've done lots of different brainstorms with lots and lots of different countries. I mean, I remember actually having some at Warner Brothers where we probably had 30 or 40 different countries all brainstorming on the same session. Um, where we'd have an ideas exchange where different people would present out ideas to each other to see where um, where the good stuff was coming from so that we could try and allocate the central budget. Um, and be really, really careful when you're presenting an idea to make sure that people have clearly understood it. Try and keep it as simple as possible. Um, and particularly when you're speaking virtually, because the difference when you're speaking virtually is that um, to when you're in a room with someone, is that um, people quite often won't stop you if they don't necessarily fully understand the idea when you're speaking on a Zoom in, the, in, in some kind of environment, similar to what we're talking, what, you know, that we're in now. Um, they'll just let the idea go. They won't stop you. Whereas if you're in a room and you don't understand, you're much more likely to stop someone. So really make sure that your idea is as clear and simple as you can possibly make it. You know, language barrier is a factor, and I know from personal experience how difficult that can be and how frustrating that can be. But simplify it, think about how you're going to present it prior to, it prior to talking about it, write it down in front of you, write a few key points of things that you really want to get across for that idea, um, and, then, and then come out with it. Um, but again, please don't let that stop you um, from, from not coming out with ideas, because you have a really important role to play with that different background that you come from. It's a really important um, and, you know, I, I would argue, essential part of the idea process. Thank you. Um, 
You've got a really interesting one that potentially from for maybe somebody trying to create that culture of, of creative thinking that we were talking about earlier. Um, and it's how do I encourage that open door thinking? So particularly for others, potentially, because um, they feel quite stuck in the, the standard thought process. And it's, you know, how do we nurture those ideas out of your your team or your colleagues? Well, again, I mean, I would have a think about some of those tips that we talked about. I mean, a lot of those really do work. So change your environment. You know, we talked about that, you know, again, no one says they come up, they're in the office when they come up with their best ideas. So get people out, take them out to different places. If you're brainstorming about something to do with, you know, be, whatever, the, whatever the sector might be, um, if you are, um, you know, trying to immerse yourself in the product as much as you can, wherever possible, whatever you're brainstorming about. Um, again, those Chatham House rules, really important to give people that safe environment so that they can really then just think about those key barriers that we, did, that we just went through on that poll. Um, you know, people being nervous, um, people being, you know, not having the, you know, the time to think. So um, address each one of those individually. So change the environment. If you can, you know, it can also be as simple, if you do, it does need to be in the office, have a, have a room, you know, call it the greenhouse, put, fake grass on the floor, make that environment feel a bit different, make sure there's natural, lots of natural light in there, maybe give people free, you know, free drinks, free food, whatever, when they're in that room to try and incentivize them a little bit. Um, the time to think. So, um, you know, create those times actually in the, in the diary where it is, you know, we, we used to have something called Creative Cafe when I was at Disney, um, where we'd all sit down and have a coffee and try and, try and de um, develop new ideas together. So establish that time to think. Um, and so just, I would go through all those different tips that we talked about because all of those are really important um, in, in leaving those train tracks of thought. And again, getting into that 82% subconscious part of your brain, um, having fun. Again, it's so important. I talked about it, you know, the example of Harry Potter um, and the way that they really did produce some of the most magical creativity that the world has ever seen by making their environments that where we were shooting just so friendly and happy and welcoming. It really does work. I mean, think about it. You know, if you're in a brainstorm, if you're in a meeting and that meeting feels intimidating, you know that it's gonna be very, very difficult to come up with ideas. So, um, you know, make, make those environments positive, make them can do places, make them places where people build on their ideas rather than trying to shoot each other's ideas down. Um, you know, I often do an exercise with people called Yes And, where you just literally, we, I give them three, four minutes in the room to come up with a, you know, I'll give them a fun topic, like a Harry Potter Christmas party, what's it going to be? And there's one rule, you just have to say Yes And. Every time someone speaks and comes up with another idea, you have to start your idea with Yes And. Um, and you can often see when literally in about three minutes, people have come up with, um, uh, you know, just so so many ideas that they never thought they would um, another one by the way as well I mean body language really important keep open less of this all of that basic stuff um, use different words as well um, so when you're trying to come up with an idea um, don't use traditional words you know words that you've constantly heard in the past that have been you know part that are part of your sort of standard vernacular think of a different way of expressing your idea using different vocabulary that you haven't used before um, but, you know, I hope some also so a lot of those tips that I talk through um, are of help because they are absolutely intended. You know, that is your question is absolutely at the crux of what we've just been talking about. Um, those 10 tips, um, I think, are really effective at, 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 at help getting you out of um, your normal you know, uh, sphere of thinking and into a sort of ever a much more bold and different way of, uh, of developing ideas. Great, thank you. We've got two minutes left, so I'm going to try and squeeze in two more questions, um, just because we've got so many and it would be a shame to, to leave some of them. Um, so I've noticed a few questions about networks and, and where you could recommend um, finding useful networks in, in this field. Um, so if you have any tips around that, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, 
it's, it's getting getting different networks going. Mean, you know, I've talked to you before, talk, talk before about, you know, all of this, you know, naive experts, getting people that you don't normally be around, um, exchanging thoughts that way. Um, you know, also, by the way, the same works vice versa. If you're talking to someone from another department or a completely different divisional line of work, you can often end up coming up with great ideas for them as well. So it's a two way process. Um, and of course, you can end up le learning a lot more about another area of business that will probably likely to be a, to be a benefit to you. So, yes, I mean, absolutely, you know, keep networking and use your ne use your network creatively. You know, LinkedIn is a really powerful resource. The Internet, you know, I mean, social media, all of these things are really important for, you know, share ideas as well. When you come up with a great new idea, um, as long as it's not proprietary, then share it on the, share it um, on on LinkedIn through, you know, to, to you know, to see if anyone else has another idea. Um, that might be able to complement yours. So yes, absolutely, using networks is massively important um, in um, you know making sure that you kind of you know really really go into a different gear when you're developing ideas. So I know I'm probably not answering the question particularly directly there, but um, yes, passionately believe in networking as part of a part of the idea generation process. Thank you. And just to finish, um, I saw a question that really nicely sums up the whole um, the whole event, really. And it's if we could take away one of the most the most important thing we can do to be more creative, what would you say that is? Um, I think probably in one word, bravery. Um, I think that's what it really comes down to, because that takes in so many other different parts, you know, elements feed into bravery believing you can do it, um, having you know, the courage side of bravery, um, supporting each other, um, supporting the ideas that you're coming up with. Um, I presented at the, um, the Cannes Lion Festival of Creativity earlier on in the year, and there the two, you know, bravery was a really, really important, um, you know, big, big, big theme for them as well, um, that everyone was going on about. Um, I do think that when you combine cr uh, creativity and bravery with really great customer insight, I think you have a very m magical combination there. I think that's the ultimate sort of when you've got really, you really understand your customers and can then come up with really creative solutions of, of, of ways of delivering for them. Um, then I think you really do have the world in your pocket. Um, but above all, yeah, I would I would say bravery is the, the biggest thing and probably also the most difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Great combination. <laughs> well, thank you. What a fascinating career you have, Jason, and also great presentation so interesting and i've certainly taken a lot away from it thank you so much for sharing that with us and for taking the time to join us this evening uh, we really appreciate it and i thoroughly have enjoyed myself and i'm sure everyone in the audience would agree with me um, that it was a truly inspiring presentation and you can see from the questions that you've provoked a lot of thought which is great um, i think my biggest takeaway is how creativity is um, all the more essential in a post-pandemic world um, and that we're all capable of it um, and that we do need to be brave in voicing our ideas and venturing outside of that safe thought space that you were speaking about. Um, as a reminder to everyone, this event has been recorded and will be shared with all of you um, over the next couple of weeks. Um, and you will also be able to find it on UCL's online networking platform, UCL Bentham Connect, along with other recordings of past Connect events, just like this one. Um, so do check those out um, as we've heard from some really incredible people over the series. Finally, please do share your feedback on this event. event. Um, you'll see a QR code on the screen, which will take you to a feedback form. Uh, this should only take a few minutes to complete, but it really does help us design the uh, future events in this series. And I've also shared a link to the form in the chat below. Um, I really hope you've enjoyed today's UCL Connect event um, and all that's left for me to do is say a huge thank you again to Jason and also to the alumni relations team at UCL who have helped organise this event. So thank you everyone and I hope to see you at another event soon.